since it is the last teaching in the book of Revelation. Don't get too scared, but we're going to review the entire book. Don't worry, though, okay? Yeah. <laughs> It'll be, uh, it won't be quick, but it will be painless, I think. Maybe not. Maybe not. So it'll be like my jokes. You know, I, I was told that uh, my, my jokes, the best part about my jokes is when they're finished. You know, when they're over with. And so maybe tonight we'll get through this together. It'll be a dredge. And then we get there and you'll be glad that it's done and that we went through the whole book again. But um, on that note, I do want to start with a, a funny little story. It's a Revelation joke as you're getting ready with your Bibles to Revelation 22. Um, it was about a pastor who was uh, visiting homes of his, his new parishioners. He'd become the pastor of a church, and um, at one house it was obvious that people were home, but no one was answering after he repeatedly knocked on the door. And so he took out a card and he wrote on it, Revelation 3.20, and stuck it in the door. And then uh, when the offering was processed the following Sunday, he found that card had been returned, and it was added with a cryptic message, Genesis 3.10. And so, reaching for his Bible to check the, out the citation, he broke up in gales of laughter. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But Gen Genesis 3.10 says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, for I was naked. <laughs> so, I like that. I don't know. But here's the thing. I think it is valid for tonight, because as we go through the book of Revelation, there's something amazing for us to remember. We're going to see our glorious future. That's what we've been looking at. And although there are many horrible and treacherous things that are going to come upon the earth, we know as the church we will escape those things. Not only that, we are going to live with Jesus Christ forever in a brand new heaven, on a brand new earth, in a new Jerusalem, and we have a beautiful and glorious future. And the great thing is, you and I are no longer naked before the Lord. We've been covered by the blood of the Lamb. You know, in the Garden of Eden, God killed an animal to give clothing to Adam and Eve. And, you know, for us, though, we have been clothed in robes of righteousness because of what our king did on the cross for us. It was the sacrifice once and for all. And so we're no longer naked before the Lord. And so on that note, we're going to review this beautiful book, this amazing book. And we know when I told you this about a little over eight months ago, when we started the teaching of this book, this book, the book of Revelation, is is about one single person. It's about the God-man, Jesus Christ. It's not about all those things that we can get sidetracked in, all of those, those horrible plagues and other things that we've read about. It's about Jesus Christ. The very first verse of Revelation told us that. And it told us that it was a book that we could understand because it was given to us in signs, in symbols. It was signified or signified. Verse 1 of Revelation 1 says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of John or of Marty or of anyone else. This is all about Jesus. Everything in this book is about him. And we've looked at that. And, uh, Verse 3 also tells us this is the only book in the Bible that tells us there's an attached blessing. Chapter 1, verse 3 says this, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And here's what I pray. I pray in the last eight months that you have been blessed. But remember this, this book is not just a blessing for those who read it. It's not just a blessing for those who hear the things that are in it. You must keep the things that are in it. And the greatest lesson in all of this, this entire 22 chapters, this book of Revelation, the greatest lesson is that it's all about Jesus, that he is central. He must be central in your life. You must be born again, or you will not escape these things that are coming. And so we must keep those things to have the full blessing of this book. And then verse 19, we saw this in chapter 1, verse 19. It's the only book of the Bible that has an outline that gives us an understanding of how this book is broken down. Verse uh, broken down. So it says, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. This was given to John and he's told these three things. Write the things which you've seen. Okay? And we know that was chapter one. 
We'll come back to that. Write the things which are, chapters 2 and 3, and write the things which will take place after this, chapters 4 through 22. And it breaks down like this. As we studied this out, we saw John had just saw the glorified, resurrected Christ in his glorified, beautiful form. All of those signs and symbols in chapter 1 were just amazing. When you start to read that out and you see the glory of our king, it's tremendous. And that was what God, or John had seen. And then it says that he was to write the things which you have seen, write the things which are. And that was chapters 2 and 3, the church. Remember, Jesus dictated seven letters to John for him to give those seven letters to those current churches, but we know they applied to all churches of all time. We also looked at how it's a prophetic timeline. But chapters 2 and 3 are about the things that are. Then chapters 4 through 22 are all of the things which will take place after this. And I told you that phrase, metatauta in the Greek, it's, it's the phrase that starts chapter 4. And chapter 4 through 22 are all about future events. Chapter 4 through 22 were all about future events, and we know there was something interesting about that because chapters 4 and 5, it broke down into three sections. Chapters 4 and 5 was about the glorious honeymoon of the church with our king in heaven. And then chapter 6 through 19, we saw this time called the tribulation, where the church was removed, we're in heaven having our, our party, our honeymoon, and then all of these plagues and things start to happen. We saw four sets of plagues, but only three were spoken about. The thunders, the seven thunders were sealed up, remember? God still keeps some mystery during the tribulation. Because people during the tribulation are going to be able to open the book of Revelation and know what's coming next. Except that God has seven thunders that he seals up. We don't know what those seven thunders are. But the first set of judgments we saw were the seven seals. And remember those seven seals, the Lord took that that scroll with the seven seals, and that was the title deed of the earth. And ho- only the Lord Jesus is able to break the seals. Remember that? So he, bra- he breaks the first one, and we saw this white horse. And we know it corresponded with the Antichrist coming to power during the tribulation. And he comes to power on a platform of peace. He has a bow, but no arrows. He has a crown. He comes to power. It's not long, though, after his platform of peace that he turns on the world, and we see war break out with the second seal and the red horse. It's followed by the black horse of famine. And remember, the rich still have their goods. The rich seemingly still seem to be doing okay at the early part of the tribulation. But it's the poor and it's the workers, it's the blue-collar people that are struggling because it says an entire day's wages it will take to buy the ingredients for a loaf of bread. Not a loaf of bread, the ingredients for a loaf of bread. And then what followed that black horse, the fourth seal, was that pale horse. And it was a green pale, it's a gangrenous green. And it's death. Death followed. And we saw that, and we saw that in that first set of plagues on that fourth seal, that a fourth of the earth was killed by these plagues. And we looked at all of that. That was about 1.7 billion people, or something along those lines, with current population statistics, and then taking out a general number for the rapture. But then we saw the fifth seal broken, and we saw the martyrs. We saw many that were killed for their faith in Christ, And then we saw that sixth seal broken and this huge earthquake that blotted out the sun and the stars of heaven fell. And then we saw the world bunker up. They went into their caves, into the mountains, and hid themselves. And in this first set of plagues, they say, who's able to stand? We know the wrath of God. The wrath of the Lamb has come, and who is able to stand? So they know. They know it's the wrath of God, and yet they still live in sin. They know it's God leading, it's God doing, and yet they still live in sin. And then we saw... It was two chapters later that we see that seventh seal broken and there was silence in heaven. Now before the seventh seal though, we saw Jesus sealed 144,000 faithful witnesses. Remember that, 12,000 from 12 tribes of Israel. Each one of those is going to be, they're going to be out there, you know, they've been called Jewish uh, Billy Grahams or maybe even Greg Laurie's, you know, if you went to Harvest last weekend. They're going to be evangelizing the earth to the Jew first, and then the Gentile. But many people are going to come to Christ during the tribulation. We saw there's a a great number, a multitude that enters heaven that can't be counted. We always cry out for revival, but know this, during the tribulation, revival is going to come. Because remember, the time of the tribulation, God is going to pour out his wrath on a world that rejected his son. He's going to be dealing with Israel corporately, but he's going to make it last as long as needed so that any that could be saved will be saved. He'll put whatever it takes in their life to get them saved. And we see a multitude that can't be numbered during the tribulation that's going to come into the kingdom of God. 
And I think that that's just God's mercy. But then we looked at the seven trumpet judgments. And in that first one, we saw a third of all vegetation on the planet destroyed. And we saw hail mixed with fire mingled with blood. Doesn't that sound intriguing? And then we saw that a third of the seas, a third of the oceans were struck and they became like blood, like the blood of a dead man. And then we saw a third of the, the sea life die. And then in the third trumpet, we saw the fresh water is struck. Something called wormwood hits the earth and all the fresh water, a third of it is poisoned, becomes blood and can't be drank. Then the fourth trumpet, we see that the light of the sun and the moon are diminished each by a third. And we see this angel crying out saying, whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. And then we saw that fifth trumpet where these demonic locusts invade the earth, where the prison in hell is opened up and these demonic locusts invade the earth and they're able to sting those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And I showed you in Jeremiah where in the Old Testament, God sealed the men of God with a tav. In the ancient Hebrew language, the tav is the symbol of the cross. And in Jeremiah, all those men with the cross on their forehead were saved. And here in Revelation, we see when these demonic locusts invade the earth, they're able to harm everyone who doesn't have the mark of God on their forehead. And remember, during that time, around five months, men are going to seek death but won't be able to find it. That's what the Bible says. And that's, that's pretty scary when you think about it. You start to really think about that. But then we see these four angels released in the sixth trumpet, and they're to bind up the river Euphrates. And they had been assigned to kill a third of mankind, which brought our total number so far to half of the earth. Half of the earth by this point will be killed, destroyed, slain for various reasons. And these are just the plagues. This doesn't include the war and the famine and some of the other things that might be happening uh, around all of this. So I don't think any of us want to be here during the tribulation. You know, and what breaks my heart is many people are clueless to the fact of what's coming. They don't realize the judgment of God is coming or they mock us when we try to tell them. They mock us because we're just silly Christians. We don't know what's real and what's fact. Everything that they have on social media and, and all of these things, that's what's real, you know? And you guys are all fake and phonies and you don't know what you're talking about and you're old and, you know. But here's the thing. One of the things I'll talk about is that at the Harvest Crusade this last week, I saw a glimmer of hope. Some of those young people, it got me. I was able to speak to some of those kids afterwards and as a pastor, they, were, they would raise their hands, the counselors and uh, pastors would come up and answer Bible questions. And the first young man, <laughs> the, the lady who was the counselor said, hi, pastor, hey, do you know anything about the rapture? <laughs> this young man wants to know. And I was like, well, as a matter of fact, um, and you know, the hunger in these kids, it's different. I haven't seen anything like this in a while. And I got to talk to several of them, and my goodness, um, something's going on. In any case, um, so we see this in the sixth trumpet. Um, half of the earth is killed, and then with the seventh trumpet, we see this glorious thing where the kingdoms of earth become the kingdoms of our Lord. What a glorious, amazing time. And here's the thing. We know that all of these, these different judgments, we know they're not sequential as far as all fitting together, you know, one after another. They, they mesh together somehow. We don't know exactly how, but we see kind of this conclusion at the end of each one of the sets of judgments. And here, I just love the fact that it says that the kingdoms of the earth became the kingdoms of our Lord. Don't you long for those days, folks? Seriously. You know, and the more that we deal with this world and the stuff in it, the more don't you just long for his kingdom come, for him to come and be here and rule and reign and to get new bodies and to be done with all the garbage we deal with, you know? But we know there was a pause also between the sixth and seventh trumpet and just like the, the sixth and seventh seals. But this time in, jo in chapter 10, we saw John was given this little book. He was going to continue in his vision and he was given this little book, and it was sweet in his mouth, but it was bitter in his stomach. And we talked about that, how that's the book of Revelation in a nutshell. 
It's sweet because we can see the victory. We can see our victory. We can see the Lord's victory. But it's bitter because look at the pain and the suffering and the agony that people are going to have to go through. But that's just like the Bible itself. I told you, you know, the Bible is one of these things that comforts the afflicted, but afflicts the comfortable. It is sweet to our mouth, but there's a bitter message. We're sinners, but there's sweetness because we're saved by grace. We're clothed in his righteousness. And we saw that. And then we also saw in chapter 11, the two witnesses that are going to testify in Jerusalem. And I talked about the technology it takes. It all exists now. The whole world's going to watch these two witnesses. And I believe it's Moses and Elijah. You can, you know, disagree and that's fine. We talked about all that. But here's the thing. The whole world's going to see these, these two in Jerusalem. How is that going to happen? Well, we know how. With internet, satellite, all this stuff, they could do it right now. Not only that, it says when they're killed and they lay dead in the street, people send gifts to each other. Well, we can do that right now, too. I told you, I love Amazon. My introverted side loves Amazon. I can buy things. It's in my house in a day or two, and I don't have to go to the store. The technology's here. But then we know after three and a half days, God is going to raise up these two witnesses. And, you know, to quote the, the prophet Scooby-Doo, rot row, the whole world's going to look and say, what just happened? And they're going to be taken up into heaven. And they're going to see it around the world. And of course, the Antichrist will have some kind of excuse for that. But the technology exists right now for all of this to happen. In Revelation 12, though, we jumped into that and we got to see a bit of a historical review that started with this sign in heaven. A woman clothed in the sun and the moon under her feet with 12 stars of garland on her head. And I took you to Genesis and showed you Joseph's dream. And Joseph's dream lines up with this. And we know this is talking about the nation Israel. And it talks about how Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, he, how he came through the nation of Israel, how Satan tried to kill him before he ever got started, but it didn't happen. And then how Jesus was caught up into heaven at the ascension. But then Satan was thrown to earth, and he became bitter and angry and meaner than ever. And he went after the believers, the Jewish believers in particular, first and foremost, who believed in Messiah, who believed in Yeshua. And he began to kill them and slay them but we know this, even though two-thirds of Israel during the tribulation will be killed, God saves a faithful remnant of one-third. That's what the scripture tells us. He saves them with wings of eagles. And we talked about how many scholars believe it's Petra. He's going to take them into Petra. That's one of the regions, one of the three regions of the world that will not be controlled by the Antichrist. And I showed you that in scripture. I don't know if it's Petra for sure, but it could be. But God is going to save a faithful one-third remnant of Israel. And remember, those Jewish believers in Yeshua are the ones who are going to mostly repopulate the earth during the millennium. That's who he's going to start with, that one-third that he keeps. And then in chapter 13, we saw the rise of the Antichrist in more detail. We saw that he came to power with his lying signs and wonders, and we saw that he wasn't alone. He had the false prophet to help him. And we looked at this false prophet who most likely is going to be a Christian of some sorts because he has the horns of a, of a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon, and he helps the Antichrist come to power. And I showed you how it's, it's pretty much like a false trinity during the tribulation where you have Satan as the false father. You have the Antichrist as the false son and you have the false prophet as the fake Holy Spirit because Satan's a liar and he's a mimicker from the very beginning and he wants to be God. And we looked at all of that technology and we saw how they come to power governmentally, economically, and religiously, and how they cause the entire world to receive a mark on their right hands or their foreheads. And we looked at this in the scripture. The mark is given in two forms, the name or the number. And it looks like it's, it's broken up into classes because we saw the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free and the slave. They have to take the mark, whether it be the name or the number, or else they'll be killed. And we looked at this. The, the technology exists right now. We looked at the quantum dot. We looked at some of these other things with the, with the Microsoft uh, uh, patent that requires body movement, you know, and the, how each person is going to have to report into the beast, into this beast system and into this image of the beast. If not, they'll be tracked, they'll be killed. So many people are going to lose their heads literally during the tribulation because they refuse the mark of the beast. But again, we know when they do that for the Lord, instant ticket to heaven. And we looked at all of that. 
And then the seven bold judgments. And I know this is a lot. Bear with me. In the seven bold judgments, we saw those with the mark of the beast got these festering, oozing, stinking sores, you know? And it's just, it's gross what these things, they're going to ooze and they're going to stink and they're going to fester. All of these people who got the mark of the beast. And then we see, though, the, tr- the, the seas actually turn all the way to the blood of a dead man. No longer a third, but the entire sea, the entire oceans turn like the blood of a dead man. And then we also see that all fresh water turns to the blood of a dead man. We see that men are scorched by the sun for a season, and then complete darkness comes upon the earth. Darkness that hurts, a darkness that can be felt. And we talked about how Exodus lines up, all of the plagues of Exodus um, in, in Egypt, how they line up with many of the plagues in Revelation. And God is dealing with the same context, the Jewish people. And then we saw in the sixth trumpet judgment, that the river Euphrates is dried up to to make way for the kings of the east. And I told you, I don't believe this is talking about China. Many scholars have said that over the years because they believe they're the only ones who could field an army of 200 million men. But the thing is, it's kings, plural. It's not king, it's kings. And I told you how a certain religion that doesn't like Israel, 1.9 billion of them live east of Jerusalem. And they live in kingdoms. So I'm just saying, you know, and it's a family feud that's been going on for centuries and millennia. And then in that seventh bold judgment, we saw an earthquake like no other. In the the sixth seal, we saw an earthquake that moved the mountains out of their place, moved the islands out of their place, but they were still there. In this earthquake, the mountains and the islands disappear. And we know the Bible says that the the earth is going to stagger like a drunk man. If you've ever seen a drunk man stagger, that's not good. So this is no joke. And then also during that time, hailstones around 100 pounds pelt the earth. Guys, you don't want to be here. If you're not a Christian tonight, look, let's just stay. I don't even care how long it takes after service tonight. Let's just talk, okay? Let me, we'll go through the whole Bible if we have to. You do not want to be here for what's coming. Most people are never even going to make it to this point anyway. But could you imagine 100 pound hailstones hitting the earth, every mountain disappearing, every island disappearing? Um, how many of you remember the earthquake a couple years ago? That was a 6.5, two, what, 200 or 100 some odd miles away, and it shook pretty good. But that's nothing. That'd be a little tremor compared to what this earthquake's going to be. Whatever happens to the earth is not good. And we know this Jesus has to intervene because no flesh would be saved if he doesn't. That's how bad it's going to get on the earth. But then also we saw, we looked at Babylon, and we looked at the inspiration of Babylon, Babel, Nimrod, and the Tower of Babel, and we looked at all false religion comes out of this mother of all harlots, Babel, and Babylon, and Nimrod, and all of this evil. And then we saw this harlot, this great harlot, and we, we saw that she cannot be the capital city of the Antichrist kingdom because it's the Antichrist kingdom that destroys her, the ten Horns, which are aligned with ten kings that give Antichrist the power, are the ones that destroy the harlot. This great harlot, remember, this is what the scripture says about her. She's the world's richest place. She made the whole world rich with her excessive luxuries. She's the world's largest consumer. She infected the world with her pornea, her pornography. She also infected the world with her pharmakia. Remember, the whole world was seduced by her pharmakia. She started good, but her foundations were broken. And in one hour, she's destroyed by fire. And the whole world mourns. And all those those, uh, people who were made rich from her excessive luxury, they also mourn. And all those who trade by ship mourn because no one consumes their goods anymore. And we looked at that. And what a stark warning for possibly us here in the United States. But heaven celebrates the destruction of this harlot because of the wickedness and the evil that she has spread around the world. And that's us. We're going to be in heaven during that time period, celebrating with our Lord. And as we saw all of this happening, we saw the armies gathering in a place called Armageddon. And it's a war that doesn't really happen because remember in chapter 19, the Lord interrupts it. King Jesus. But guess who comes with him? You and I, all of us. We are going to return, and we looked at this. We're going to be on horses. 
So, okay, last week I was talking about are there going to be animals in heaven? Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to make more people mad tonight. So here's the thing. I know there's animals in heaven. We got horses. But then people want to know if their dog Fido or whatever is going to be in heaven with them. Here's the thing. The Bible doesn't tell us, but the Bible seems to indicate they don't have souls like you and me. And I don't know what Savior died for animals. I'm just saying, you know. So, so remember this, too. We looked at a passage in Isaiah that anything that makes us sad or that makes us miss or anything like that is going to be forgotten. So I will just comfort you with this. I don't believe animals go to heaven. The, your pets, I don't believe they go to heaven. Um, but you won't remember that. But here's the thing about that. In the original creation, the heaven and the earth, God put animals all over the earth, and Adam was able to name them. And I believe, personally, this is my opinion, this is, not, this is the filter of Marty, this is not the Bible, I believe there was some form of better communication between animals and humans prior to the flood. And I think God in his grace and his mercy allowed some animals to still be domesticated because that relationship is really special. It really is. For those who don't love animals, that's fine, I get it. But, <laughs> but you understand, those of you who are animal lovers, there's a special relationship. And I think God allowed that in his mercy. Well, do you think in a brand new heaven and a brand new earth it's going to be void of animals? God tends to do things over and over. And if his original creation had animals, I believe the new heaven and new earth will probably have animals. I also know we're going to have horses. That's what the Bible says. I don't believe it's allegory. We're returning on horses. So whatever that means. So now that some of you are mad at me, let's go forward. So let's look at some of the great things about the Lord's return because this, this will maybe get us our minds off that, but also this is our promise. This is what I love. We looked at chapter 19 where the Antichrist and the false prophet are defeated and thrown into the lake of fire alive where they'll spend eternity. And then in chapter 20, we saw Satan bound for a thousand years while Christ rules and reigns on the earth. And we looked at that millennial kingdom and how special that it's going to be, that you and I are going to rule and reign with our Messiah, our King. I mean, it's pretty incredible that you and I get to be royalty I mean, don't look around the room and don't look at anybody in particular, but just think about all of us in this room are royalty. <laughs> oh, you look at me. Could you imagine? I'm going to be royalty. I'm going to be a king and a priest forever. And we are special. The church is special. We don't realize how special we are and how much our king loves us. We don't realize how much the Lord adores you in me. And I pray that we can even get a glimpse of that as we study this out. How much our king loves us. So much that he went to a cross. So much that the king of the universe, Emmanuel, the God-man, came down and lived a life among us. Became a little baby that had to be taken care of. Became so humble and walked among us. And he went through everything we go through. Betrayal and hurt and agony and pain. And all these things we go through. And yet he went willingly to that cross for you and me. The king of the universe. Came down off his throne. And went to a cross for you and me. And when he's on the cross. Seeing the very creation that he had made. Spitting at him. Cursing at him. They had nailed him there. And he just hung there and suffocated slowly for each one of them in love and for you and me. When you really think about that, it's overwhelming what our king did for us. It's overwhelming. We are special. You are special to him. You're the bride of Christ. It means something. Remember that. Live your life as such. We shouldn't be wasting a single minute or hour. We shouldn't waste a single moment. This life is but vapor. This life will be over in a moment. And only what you do for Jesus Christ will last for eternity. You're special, church. Remember that. Each one of you. And remember why we serve him. Remember that. He is a king that knows everything you go through. And he is a king that suffered and died and bled for you and me and suffocated on a cross. 
and he gave us a future and a hope. And it's beyond anything we could ever imagine or think. And we looked at that, that new city we're going to dwell in, this new Jerusalem, and we saw that it was mostly transparent. And we know that Jesus himself is going to be the light of that city. It's never going to be dark there. He's going to shine. His glory will be there. He's the temple. We don't need a church. He's our church. And we also saw that that city is going to be 1,500 miles squared. <laughs> with 12 giant gates on each wall, each gate a giant pearl, each gate with the name of the tribe, uh, tribe of Israel. We saw the 12 foundations or levels that have 12 names of the apostles. We talked about that. And then last week we looked at the first five verses of chapter 22, and we saw that the, the, re, the return of the tree of life, it's coming back for us. And we saw this river that's going to flow out of the new Jerusalem and the tree of life that's going to span this river. And each month it's going to produce different fruit. And, and those leaves are for the healing of the nations, but that word means it's therapeutic. It's basically a therapy. It's therapeutic benefit for those who eat of it, who take of it. And that brings us finally, <laughs> that wasn't too bad, was it? That brings us finally to Revelation 22, verse 6 as we finish this book. Revelation 22, verse 6 says this. I'll read through verse 11. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. You know, this book, it just builds on itself. And honestly, when you get to chapter 22, it's, a, it's like you just want to sing these lyrics. You know, you want to sing every line in this, in chapter 22. But one of the things I want to point out is that, you know, the word there for shortly, you know, as a short person, I always see those words. You know, I'm a little sensitive, you know. But that word shortly is taku, and I've heard pastors joke, it's not taco, okay? It's taku, and it means this. It means that when it begins to happen, then it'll happen quickly. It'll, it's kind of like, I've heard it described uh, when you're driving maybe to Dallas, Texas from Utah, and when you, when you get on the road, maybe 400 miles out, you might see a sign that says Dallas, 400 miles. But as you get closer to the city, more and more signs appear. And then it happens. You're in Dallas. Well, that's the way this is talking about. It says, when the things of this book start to happen, they will unfold quickly. And that word quickly right there means suddenly. The one right says coming quickly means suddenly. And then we see this reiteration of an attached blessing here. In verse 7, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. There's a reiteration of verse 3 in chapter 1. There's a blessing with this book. If we apply the things in this book, if we apply the lessons of this book, and then I love this about John because I can fully understand this. Put yourself in John's position. He's being led around heaven and all these things. He's seeing all these visions and he bows down to this guy and I think any of us would have done the same thing. He says, don't do that. I'm one of you. I'm, I'm one of the prophets. I'm one of your brethren. But I just want you to think about the contrast for a second because I think this is interesting for you and me. John is in prison on the island of Patmos. That's a place where they have to truck in water. Even today, they still have to truck in water. Not a lot of water. It's parched. He's in a place of imprisonment. He's there alone in his, basically a cell, his cave, in this horrible place. And then he's taken to heaven. Think of the stark contrast. <laughs> and then I want you to think about this. One day, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. 
We don't even realize we're, we're sitting here. Now, some of you realize this more than others, but you know, our bodies, even when we're just sitting here and we don't have no major pain, we're still in pain. Our bodies always have a pain to it. We just get used to it. Imagine the stark contrast when you get your new body. And here's the thing. And people say, well, how do you know that, you know, we're going to make it to the rapture? Well, maybe some of us won't, but we all have a personal rapture. Every single person. Remember the statistics on death? Remember I told you they're staggering one out of every one. So here's the thing. If you don't get raptured, you're still going to die. <laughs> I'm here to encourage all of us tonight. <laughs> so you're going to croak. You're going to kick the bucket or you're going to get raptured. So am I. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait. But until then, we have work to do. Until the trumpet, we have a lot of work. Until your last breath, we have a lot of work to do. But here's what I know. John, he's bowing down at everybody because he's, he was just taken out of prison and he's in heaven. And he's seeing things he, he doesn't even fully understand. And they're glorious. And one day that's going to be you and me. And then though... The Lord throws down this gauntlet and he says, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. You know, the book of Hebrews tells us from the time of Christ until even now is the last days. It's the last days. Well, as we've gone through this, we've talked about several signs that are around us. I believe we're in the last of the last days. You don't have to believe that. That's I'm fine with that. But here's what I know. We're supposed to believe that. God has always declared to every generation that he is coming at any moment. And I think he puts just enough ambig ambiguity in there in the scripture so that every generation believes they are the one. But here's what I know. It's overwhelming right now. Everything that's coming together, all of the signs, everything, all the technology, everything that's happening is coming together in a way that is never done before. And I would just challenge you to live like it. Live like it. I believe we're living in the last of the last days. And here's the other thing. Remember this. A day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. It's been 2,000 years since Christ. That's just a couple days for God. <laughs> you know, but one of the most interesting things, I never really got into it, but there's this prophecy of the first word of the Bible. Bereshit means beginning. And uh, I wish I had time. I'd go into it. I don't have time. But literally, there's a prophecy in that. And then the, the old Hebrew writings, they talked about this. They believed in what was called the 6,000 years of man. And six is the number of man. Well, man left the Garden of Eden around 6,000 years ago. And we're promised a thousand year millennium, a, a, a thousand years of rest, Sabbath, Shabbat. Six days and a rest. 6,000 years and a thousand year millennium. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying this is written about in tons of old Jewish literature. And when you start to look at it, it's pretty crazy. And when you start to look at that first word, Bereshit, there's some things in there that calculate out to that same number. And it's pretty incredible. And I'll just throw that out there just to, just to wet your whistle, maybe challenge you to study it yourself. But he's coming for us soon. But notice this, he gives a choice. Do you know no one is going to be dragged into heaven kicking and screaming, I don't want to go to heaven. No, you're coming. Love demands a choice, right? We've talked about that. But look at verse 11 again. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. Ultimately, make your choice. Each one of us have a choice to make. Make your choice. And then we see Jesus repeating himself, which, by the way, the Bible does this, doesn't it? Over and over. You want to know why? Because I'm dumb. Because I need it. I'm not saying that about you guys. I'd never say that about you guys. But we need messages over and over, don't we? That's how we learn. But notice he adds something here. Verses 12 through 14 again. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Folks, when he comes for us, he's bringing his reward with him. Remember, we will not stand at the great white throne judgment, but we will stand at the Bema Seat of Christ. And our works will be tested. 
And the thing about it is I want all of us to finish well. Because the fruit of your life tells a lot about you. Do you know that? When you think about the fruit that's in your life right now, that tells you a lot about who you are. Tells you a lot about your faith. Robert Mounts in his commentary said this, it is the quality of a man's life which provides the ultimate indication of what he really believes. What does your life say about your beliefs? It's a question only you can answer, really. I mean, others around you see it. And some say, well, you know, I've heard this said, and you might have heard this said, well, I'm fine with just being a janitor in heaven. You know, as long as I get there, I'm happy with just being a janitor in heaven. But then I always tell them, okay, but what if Jesus isn't? Do you know he wants more for you? He wants more from you, but he wants more for you. He doesn't just want you to be a janitor in heaven. And I know that's, that's kind of funny because I don't think there's janitors in heaven. But you know what I'm saying? People say, well, I'm just happy to get in. But that's not what the Lord wants from any of us. He wants your life to produce fruit. He wants you to be a living testimony. He wants you and I to finish well, to have reward. And I get it. We'll have those crowns, those different crowns. I get it. And we're going to throw them right back at his feet happily. But he wants the best for you. And he wants the best from you. You know, and some people are content with just the same old, same old. You know, they'll sit around. They say, you know, yeah, I know Jesus is coming. I was just talking to a guy. Um, and uh, it's a relative of mine, so I, <laughs> I'll probably edit this out so he doesn't, just in case, I don't get in trouble. And he was like, yeah, you know, I don't really go to church anymore. I just, you know, I, I watch online and, you know, I read my Bible and I just pray for people. And I'm like, whoa, God's called you to more than that. Well, you know, but I, you know, I give my tithe and I just read my Bible and I just, but you're called to more than that. And he's just content with the same old fruit. And, it, and I'm always thinking about that. And I was like, what is wrong with people who just want comfortable fruit, who never want to be challenged? Some people say, well, I'm old. I got worn out fruit. <laughs> you know, the thing is, I got no fruit left. I can't do it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Or some people say, I'm too young. I, I got to enjoy life first. Oh, yeah. I think all of us know what that means. And all of us think back and go, man, I wish I wouldn't have enjoyed life so much. (laughs) You know, not all of us. Some of you were holy and righteous and all that, but some of us were rebels. Or they say, you know, I'm too young. I can't be used. Yes, you can. The young can be used. The old can be used. Everyone in between can be used by God. Or some say, I'm too busy. And God understands I have to make a living. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart is. What do you treasure? What kind of fruit is your life producing? Well, I've been hurt. I've been offended. Yeah, join the club. (laughs) And guess what? I'm probably going to hurt and offend you too, but we love each other through it. True believers love each other through it, and we get through it. We forgive each other. There's no excuse for a believer not to seek the best for their life. God wants the best for you, and he wants the best from you. He wants your life to ring true. He wants fruit, and he wants to reward you. Do you not understand? Again, you're special. And we come up with many excuses. We come up with many excuses, but those excuses just aren't good enough. And at the sake of offending people, what are you doing for Christ? What are you really doing? What's your focus? You know, one of my favorite stories, Pastor Tim and I were talking about this. I found the story, Tim. I found the story. It was from a Chuck Swindoll book, of all places. Um, So one of the the greatest stories I ever heard, and I tried to find it, so I found it, but it was in this news article that a guy, it had impacted him so much that he wrote about it in this article. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll summarize it. I'll read some of it. But this story is from a Chuck Swindoll book, and he talked about how in the northeastern United States, there was this um, demand for this certain kind of codfish, and everyone really loved it. And the problem is they were having trouble shipping it. 
around the nation because it would get, they would freeze it and it would lose all its flavor. They would try to keep it in live wells and it would get mushy and gross. Okay. So they began to experiment with different ways of shipping their product. At first, again, they froze it. Um, they discovered freezing destroyed the natural flavor. Then they attempted to ship them live. That didn't work. A number of issues arose. And then finally, someone began to think outside the box. And they said, uh, we'll start to look at this a little closer. They began to look at how the codfish lived and survived in the vast expanse of their natural habitat, the ocean. This person or persons began to look into the natural things in the life of a codfish to see if they might discover an answer there. They found out that the codfish has a natural enemy, the catfish. So the shippers, going on the word of these codfish experts, began to ship their codfish alive in tanks of salt water, along with their natural enemy, the catfish. Something amazing happened. From the time the codfish were shipped from their point of origin on the East Coast until they arrived at their final destination all over the country, um, those cantankerous catfish chased the natural codfish prey all over the tank. Do you know what happened? The codfish arrived at their destination just as fresh as they were when they were first caught. They neither had lost any of their flavor nor was their texture affected. The answer to a bad business problem had been solved, albeit in an unusual way. Ship the codfish with its enemy, and the codfish will arrive healthy, tasty, and strong. You know how much God loves you? <laughs> he loves you enough to put a catfish in your life. Sometimes God will put people or circumstances in your life to motivate you to keep you fresh, to keep you vibrant. You know, sometimes when we're looking around and we're, Lord, you know, life's getting tough. <laughs> Ask yourself a question, why? Or maybe circumstances are motivating you. You know, I have to say, it doesn't always have to be a negative thing, this catfish. Since Harvest Crusade, I've had the catfish of this generation swimming after me in ways I can't explain and I can't get over it, <laughs> and I don't want to get over it. What is your catfish, or catfishes? Is that even a word, catfishes? What's the plural? Anyone know? Any English majors in here? God will put as many catfish in your life <laughs> as needed. And again, it doesn't have to be negative. Don't think of it as your enemy. Think of it as your friend. That's how much Jesus loves you. He promises you that he will keep you on track. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. What do you think he's going to do? If there's something in your life that needs changing and you won't change it, God will put a catfish in your life. But you better listen. If you don't listen, you'll get a bigger catfish. And if you continue not to listen, trust me on this, you'll get an even bigger catfish. And you won't like those whiskers. But not only that, how many times in your life are you motivated by, like I said, the thing we just saw last weekend, the Harvest Crusade? You know, I know it's just, it's just this crusade that was put on and, and all of this, but there's a bigger issue in this world. This young generation has been lied to. They've been robbed. And if we won't go, go get them, who will? You know, if you look at the Calvary Chapel movement, back in the day, in the 60s and 70s, they threw away the hippies. There was no hope for them. Even Pastor Chuck wasn't a big fan of the hippies. It was his wife, Kay, who said, you know, Pastor, I think we need to go talk to these. And he's like, I don't want to talk to them. You know, he was just this grouchy guy. He even admit, admitted that. You know, there's never been a greater generation gap than right now because of technology. The younger folks need us, and they need the gospel. And there's a hunger there I haven't seen at least in what I saw last week. So I hope that motivates you as much as it's motivating me. Now, I'm probably going to get in a little bit of trouble again here. Revelation 22:15. when it's talking about outside here, it's talking about outer darkness. It's talking about outer darkness. This is a, an expression. It's, remember, it's a warning. This verse is a warning to those who are reading now that you don't want to be in outer darkness. You don't want to be outside the kingdom of God. And it says this, 2215, but outside are dogs, and I'll just stop there. So all dogs don't go to heaven, all dogs go to hell. It says it right here, look, but outside are dogs. And that's just a joke, folks, okay? Don't be barking at me. The thing is, 
Dogs here is an expression for a type of person that acts like a dog. I won't go into that. But outsider dogs and sorcerers, and that's also the word for drugs, and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. This is talking about the lost. And remember, we looked at this in Corinthians. And so were some of us. But we're saved by grace alone, through faith, and not of works, lest any man should boast. But this is a warning for those reading you now. And look at, look at, however, for you and me, look at this. Look at how fortunate we are. Verses 16 and 17. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The gospel is free for you and me. It's free. Now it cost him everything. His life, the pain he went through. But we know he resurrected as a beautiful promise. But it's free. And it's free to give out the gospel. It's free to share it with other people. It's free to receive. Just share it with people. And we get to drink freely of the water of life. I mean, think about that promise. I'm not even going to repeat it. Just think about that promise. But then look at this. Jesus gives a very stern warning, okay? Especially to those of us who would teach the word, but it's not just to us, of a, us that teach the word. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 and 19. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Oof. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Remember, James chapter 3 tells me, as a Bible teacher, I'm held to a higher standard of judgment. I take this very serious. The Bible tells me I'm going to be held accountable to a higher standard teaching God's word. But that means not just what I teach, and I've talked about this, but what I don't teach. Not... This says if you add anything, you're going to get the plagues that are written in this book, but also if you take away. Just as a Bible teacher, I'm going to be judged to a higher standard for whatever I teach and what I don't teach. As a watchman on the wall, I better teach the things of Scripture. I better not be a coward as a pastor. People need to know the days we live in. People need to know what's coming. If we don't tell them, how will they know? We will be judged for every word we teach as Bible teachers, but we will be judged for every single word we don't teach. And you know what? The Bible says anyone who adds to the prophecy of this book or anyone who takes away are going to suffer. And I think about, you know, some of the cults, some of the things they add and take away from Scripture, especially the book of Revelation. Think of the judgments that's coming upon them and upon those leaders who proclaim these things. We need to take it very serious. Jesus does. Remember, he esteems his word above his name. This is his word. He esteems his word above his name. It's not to be handled improperly. And Jesus told us in Matthew 24, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. His words are forever. Forever. They will be with us in heaven for eternity. But I love how the Bible ends. You know, one thing I'll say about this, though. Recently, you know, Elon Musk, you know, he bought Twitter and all that, and that's, that's good. Maybe we'll get some free speech back. But you know what breaks my heart? Elon Musk was interviewed by the Babylon Bee Christian satire <laughs> group. It was like an hour-long interview. At the end, they really didn't give him much of the gospel. They tried, but it wasn't really a good effort. But you know, they asked Elon Musk, if you could add any book to the Bible, what would it be? And Elon Musk thought about it. And he sat there and he said, Revelation part two, but with a happy ending. You know what breaks my heart is he doesn't realize it has a happy ending. But to him it doesn't. He's right. I wish he'd, you know, be able to read the book of Revelation the way we read it and understand it the way we understand it. But he's not alone. How many more lost are out there? 
seeking all of their fulfillment. You know, he's seeking this fulfillment off planet for Pete's sake. You know, he wants to go to Mars, all these things. But the book of Revelation does have a happy ending. It's beautiful. It's amazing for you and I. Look at this, verses 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. For the third time in this chapter, Jesus tells us he's coming quickly. And folks, he's coming quickly. We ought to be ready. But one of the side notes here I want to talk about is this is really remarkable. I've told you guys, I talked about the Tetragrammaton. Remember the, the name of God, yud heh vav heh And I told you about the Hebrew language and how every single Hebrew letter has a picture meaning. Each one of those letters have a picture meaning that give you a broader uh, explanation of the word itself. So the Tetragrammaton, yud heh vav heh Yud, the works of God's hands, his hand. That's what Yud is. Hey is a man revealed with his arm outstretched. Vav is a nail. Hey is a man who reveals himself again with his hands outstretched. It's the story of Yeshua. The Tetragrammaton, the name of God, Yahweh, Yehoah. It's the story of Jesus. yud heh vav heh But you know what I love? We get another beautiful little wink at the end of the Bible. Because you know, amen, amen, is a Hebrew word, amen. The root word for amen means to fasten with a nail. Means to secure with a nail. It means so be it. But the root word means to fasten with a nail or to secure with a nail. But it doesn't stop there. Amen. Last word of the Bible. I told you earlier, the first word of the Bible is bereshit, beginning. Now we know Jesus is the first and the last. So let's take the first letter and the last letter of the Bible. He ends the Bible in Hebrew. He began the Bible in Hebrew. The first letter of the Bible in Bereshit is Bet. The last letter in Amen is Nun. Bet Nun. You know what word that is? Ben. You know what that is in Hebrew? Son. I told you the book of Revelation is all about Jesus, and it is. But so is the whole Bible. The entire Bible is about him because he's the creator of the universe. He is the only son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. He's the creator of all things. He's the word of God. He's the savior, the savior, the redeemer, the bread of life, the holy one of Israel, the wonderful counselor. Is he your wonderful counselor today? He's the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He's the head of the church. He is the alpha and omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the king of the Jews. He's the great high priest. He's the prophet. He's the teacher. He's the advocate. Is he your advocate? He's the mediator. He's the judge. He is the chief cornerstone. He's the lamb of God. He's the good shepherd. He's the rock. He's the Messiah. He's the true vine. He's the branch. He's the bridegroom. Is he your bridegroom? He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Is he yours? He's the great I am. And he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And folks, he's coming quickly. He's coming soon. I want to finish well. Don't you want to finish well? Even so, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, love you guys. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the redemption that we've been given. Lord, we are not worthy. And God, I pray right now for a baptism of Holy, the Holy Spirit upon this church and upon these people, upon Pastor Tim and upon uh, Pastor John. I pray, Lord, that you do a mighty work here, Lord. I pray that you pour out your spirit and that you erupt in this valley, Lord, that revival break out, Lord, that we will go and rescue your people from the lies and the sin and the deceit of the enemy. And God, I pray that you pour out 
that your kingdom come. I pray that you get the glory in everything we do that all of us do, Lord. It's not about us. It's about you and your kingdom. God, let us remember that. And God, just fill us with your presence. We can't do a single thing without you. It's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And we need it more and more every day. Lord, baptize us fresh with your Holy Spirit. Let us know your word like never before. Help us to share your gospel like never before. And Lord, we declare Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. But until then, Lord, help us, prepare us. Entrench us in battle and warfare, Lord, and help us go forward and reach a generation that so desperately needs it. And God, I just pray for a blessing upon all of us here tonight and those who are watching and Lord, those who couldn't be here. And I pray you renew us and you strengthen us and you encourage us. And God, put people in our lives that we can share your truth. God, help us to lift up your word and help us to be those who live it out. Lord, we praise you and we honor you. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua Hanatsri Yumelech HaKuhidim, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.